the soles of her feet. This one is called a musical Cinderella, and the other one is called a novel Cinderella. So I'm reading to you from the second chapter. You all know the Cinderella story, and the, the book starts because um, I fictionalized Michael and, our, and myself saying that we ran an internet contest to find somebody who had lived a real fairy tale life. And this character, Ashley St. Helens, she won the contest, and she's writing her memoir for us. For us. So first I'm going to read to you chapter two, The Virtue of Rags, and then I'm going to read to you a little bit of the backstory um, that's, that's embedded in it. Hopefully that won't take too long. We can get to Julie. <laughs> After the funeral, I started hanging out in the attic where my mom's book collection was stored in cardboard boxes. Most of the shelves in the house had long been given over to pictures of our new family, popular magazines, and knickknacks. A kind of peace came over me in that peace room. Everything in it was old and therefore uninteresting to Donna and Deborah, so I had my peace. It was a lovely old attic with wood paneling and a window that looked over the front driveway that led in some nice afternoon sunlight. I did a lot of reading, or so it appeared, but what I remember most now are those lost hours when I would find myself reading a paragraph over and over again, then letting my eyes unfocus a bit, then finding myself watching the dust motes float in, the, in a sunbeam and wonder at them. Are there dust motes in the shadows, too? Am I breathing dust motes? What are they made of? Are they all little worlds like important here to do? These reveries would come upon me often that year, almost as if my organized mind went into idols so another part of me could grow. The girls teased me about being ADD, as kids still do. Sylvia criticized me for being spacey, but she was right. In my mind, I would hear my mother's voice teasing me fondly for being a dreamer, but respecting the work of a wool-gathering mind. The rest of the house, which I passed through only to get food and use the bathroom, gradually became theirs. When the rare guest came over, Sylvia would host them in the slip-covered section of the living room just inside the front door, with all the other doors closed, as if it were still the 1800s. Here's why. All of the other rooms were gradually being neglected to death. A shopping bag from Target would stay in the family room where it was empty. A spill on the stairs when someone was bringing food to their room would be left and passing feet with grind cheetahs into the runners next to the piles of clothes that no one knew whether they were going up or down. Rubber bands from the newspapers sprang into corners, never to be retrieved, and the papers themselves would be left on the table after being read, open to the sale pages, or more often stacked up by the fireplace on red. Hair scrunchies, clothing tags, toenails slipping with gum wrappers, and gum itself would be left behind without consciousness. No one ever had time to vacuum. Coffee rings and spilled food stayed on tabletops. Takeout containers, straws from sodas, lids from energy drink bottles were left on every horizontal surface. A former mocha latte lay with, with a former mocha latte with a layer of mold sat on it sat beside the television. And all of the casserole dishes and frozen dinner boxes that friends and neighbors brought by in sympathy just stacked up in the sink. After a month or so, I couldn't stand it anymore. Passing through the house on my way out the door would turn my stomach, and I never knew what I might step on. In a way, in a very twisted way, the hill, that was their last name before Sylvia married my dad, I still think of her as a hill, did me a favor. Their clutter is what finally brought me out of my shell. One night I just started cleaning and it felt good. After that, when everyone went to bed at night, I'd go attack a problem, a stairway, a kitchen, a bathroom. It was my house, my mother's house, and I didn't like to see it looking so awful. Besides all the yelling, the whining was getting to me. Where's my magazine? Has anyone seen my other leg warmer? I put my reading glasses right here and now they're gone. I swear this house is eating things. I swear this house hates us. Mom! So a little by little light took back the house. When I told Linda this story, we were sitting on the lawn outside our dorms where we always had our best conversations in college. She was very impressed. You know, dust and clutter create a very negative spiritual energy, she said. There is a stickiness to it that attracts more dust and clutter, and this energy affects our minds, too. It's why the Chinese start their New Year with required crackers, scaring that energy away, cleaning every corner of their house, getting new clothes and haircuts. It's good feng shui to have clean corners. There, I told myself when she said this a few years later, there, I had been doing a spiritual service to myself, the hills and my parents all along, without even knowing it. I had once read a book I liked that had this sentence in it. When she cleaned up her house, she cleaned herself up inside, too. Now I understood why my mother had been so dedicated to her household tasks. I found some old 
clothes of hers in a box in the attic. Cute summer frocks and sweaters mostly, and a box of sweatpants and t-shirts that had been my dad. He had apparently collected them from every college he visited when he was my age. The sweatpants became my uniforms when I cleaned. Eventually I started wearing them out of the house. There was never any time to change. I found I was growing out of all my old clothes anyway, and wearing my memories made me feel so much better. I tore my worn out pajamas into flannel rags. Sylvia would screech in disgust when she saw me clean with them, diving for the chemical wipes that were now being advertised on TV. But one day she came home to me carting a box of her chemical cleaners out the door. I replaced everything in the house with non-toxic substitutes. She had a fit, but I held my ground. When she was done yelling, I just came right out and calmly reminded her how my mother had died. That shut her up for a while. In chapter one, we learned that her mother died in a tragic cleaning accident and got some extraneo with the plumber. <coughs> I used to spend an hour or more in the laundry room each day, reading between tasks. The moist tropical warmth of the dryer made it a cozy place. The loose ends of my hair would curl on their own as it's free for once to express themselves. One day I was sitting on the washer waiting for it to stop the spin cycle. Just as it slowed to a stop, I finished reading Task of Metamorphosis, and between the dreamlike story and the lonely motion of the ride, I was in another world. Everything was still for a moment, and in the far in the distance, a curious thing happened. The phone rang upstairs. Now in that house, I rarely heard the phone ring in the afternoon since Deborah or Donna were always talking on it and incoming calls would beep in their ears instead of out loud. A moment later, Donna burst into the room with said phone attached to the side of her head, blabbing away to one of her girlfriends about, as usual, clubs. Let me try to record this faithfully. It was pretty amazing. Hold on. This is going to be hard. <laughs> oh, yeah, this is going to be loud. That does say vinegar, so I know we're cleaning from it. Is clean water? Could you raise the mic a little bit? Sure. See, usually you're not tolerant. Oh, by the way, you know how they say break a leg? My shoes exploded on the way here, and I had to stop and go to hardware store to buy some glue. I call them, they're, they're full of glitter, I call them the ground glass slippers. <laughs> so, did you see in the latest issue of Teen Princess, they have those thigh-high stockings with the cross-stitch ribbing? No, not those, those were cute too, but I don't like wide stripes, they make my legs look too fat. Yes, and did you see the shoes she was wearing with them? Oh my god, anyway, I'm all like, aren't those adorable? They're too cute, and so new, they're just a thing, I have to have them, and I was like, trying to order them online, but they declined my credit card because it maxed it out again, I forgot I was waiting for Mother to get another mortgage. So I left them in my cart, and since it may be a while before I can get them, but I hope they're not like totally out of style, but then I can complete the transaction. But anyway, I have email apps or circumference since my thighs are only 16 inches, and they might not even stay up. <laughs> I kid you not, one sentence. <laughs> Donna was generally so afraid of dirt and food that there was never a chance she'd get any on her clothes, since she would never exert herself. There was never a chance of B.O. either. Still, she'd bring me an outfit, or two, or five, every day to wash out the perfume, which she changed daily. In a typically brainless gesture, she, jumped, she dumped the pile right on the stack of laundry I had already folded. Deborah came in right behind her. Deborah, who was a year older and about ten ounces heavier than Donna, always calls her clothes by their proper name. Ashley, here's my Spanx, she announced, and my Juicy Pants, with their name iced across the velour butt cheeks, and my cotton candy Betsy Johnson cashmere shrub. Deborah was a big fan of designers, but Donna obsessed on the other label, the little shiny one sewn in the seam. She run, rummaged through the pile she just tossed down and located each care label, holding it up to my face to make sure I saw the little European X, with the little X through the icon of the iron, or having to decipher washing instructions printed in a European language. Here's my Nancy Gant, she sung out, holding up a leopard print body shaper and giving Deborah's face a superior look. Deborah let out a. a <laughs> A tip with an exasperated breath as Donna fished for the label. Hand washed separately. She turned her great big brown eyes on me, checking for understanding. I held her gaze deliberately, pressing my lips together to keep the words in my head from coming out, and using all my willpower to avoid rolling my eyes at her sister. These are power lycra, see? Donna pulled the waistband out two feet and let the elastic snap back to doll size. Steel, stretch! Those are sure some super underpants, I nodded very slowly and appreciatively as I did several times a week. While I was nodding, I noticed my brain wondering why at 17 Donna felt she needed tummy control. Nod, nod, nod. I said, I'll make sure they smell baby fresh. Linda has helped 
helped me since to understand that De Sana and Deborah's body of food issues were inflamed by this perfectionist mother, the only one in the family who actually needed old-fashioned foundation garments to make her clothes work. But back then, it baffled me why a side negative two would need such a thing. But just as I opened my, my mouth to say so, Sylvia, who entered a room chin first, as if that made her taller somehow, and her cheekbones more aerodynamic, came through the swinging doors of that laundry room. Donna's babbling stopped cold. For a moment there, it seemed as if the fog clinging to the windows was frost. Now it was Sylvia's turn to hand me a silky bundle. I need some press, dear. Quite baffled, I and very emphatically did not point out the factor that if there's a wrinkle in your girdle when it's hanging limp in your hand, it's not going to be there the minute you stretch it across your hiney. Instead, I said, sure, Sylvia, in a forcefully cheerful tone, my best way of maintaining my distance and avoiding any possibility of a fracas. <coughs> the night of many girdles, at least, inspired me to write one of my best college essays. I gathered Sylvia's creamy white maiden form, Donna's animal style landing and Deborah's rough flesh stone spanks in one hand. Then I reached for Deborah's cotton candy, be cotton candy Betsy Johnson cashmere shrug and said with a pleading smile, I'll do a load of delicates right now. It was as if I just announced my intention to slice everything into ribbons. No, I don't need a wash of press. Sylvia grasped her underwear from my hands. No, Ashley, says hands wash separately. Separately, you know each piece. Donald's baffling logic still stunned me. It's cashmere, Ashley. That's not cheap, Deborah shouted hysterically, like she cared about price shopping. Well, actually, she did care. If something was on sale, it typically, was, typically wasn't good enough for her. I put all their pet clothes down carefully, stepped away, and said in my own defense, I'll be here all night. Well, do mine first, said Deborah. I'm older. Mom, whined Donna. Sylvia thrust her garment back at me. Ashley, I'm warning you, don't incite my daughter. I nodded, just barely enough for her to think I was obeying. But Sylvia was oblivious. She focused on her daughter, her eyes unusually lively, un even moist with excitement. Now, girls, she said to the girls, time to get some beauty sleep. One of you is going to win the prom. I just know it. She was practically singing. The girls caught her energy and began to bounce. Enough with this sibling rivalry, Sylvia said, shooting her eyes at me but speaking with an offhand tone as she herded them out of the room. We just never used to have so much of it before, did we? Did we? The girls were giggling now, but I caught the verbal dagger with my stomach. And win the prom, seriously? Yeah, I, I'm, I'm, I realize I'm out of time, so I'm just going to give you guys a couple peeks at the um, at the sub the sub story here. So uh, when you read this, there's a little email here at the bottom, and this one has Michael writing to me saying, "Here's my idea for the opening number." <coughs> oh no, this is me saying, "Here's an idea for the theme for the opening number." And then Michael writes back and he says, I don't know, that just really didn't do it for me. I struggled rather not to say that, but you know, let me try something, you know, let me try something else. And then I write back to him and say, I'm not mad at you, but um, but here's some lyrics that you asked for. And then the next one is, okay, I haven't heard from you for a month, so I don't know if you're still on board with me. So I went on the internet and I recorded this tune with some automatic software. And maybe I can write this musical without you. <laughs> and then Michael writes back and goes, Ha ha, happy April Fool's Day to you too, because all these emails have dates. <laughs> and he says, yeah, but the, the lyrics aren't working for him. But here's a clip of what I think it should sound like. That's Michael. And because there's an actual... Yeah, I'm sure you guys can't hear this, but there's an actual musician now writing. <laughs> so anyway, then then we get a letter from uh, from uh, the, the the professor who turned them on has has sent the essay to um to Kristen, the fictional Kristen uh, that that Ashley wrote about girdles, and that's all here in a pop up, and you can read that essay, and then at the end. Um, you see an article about step families that Professor Marsh has written. It also pops up, and you can read that. And all these, um, a couple different uh, articles that show you um, some working lyrics mm -hmm. and so forth. So uh, it's a book that you can read over and over again a couple different ways. Um, and I have to stop reading now. Thank you very much.